Greetings and blessing, New Heritage community and friends, as we gather together to worship and share the Word of God. The past few weeks, we've had the opportunity to join our voices, following the model of Daniel, to petition the heart of God morning, noon, and evening, to heal the land, restrain evil, and release the promise. Let's take this time together and follow the morning model of day one for the healing of our land. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Father, we decree humility and conviction are blanketing your people. We decree that the spirit of grace and supplication is being released and is producing a turning of hearts one to another. There is a heart change coming to this nation. We decree a forgiveness revival that will heal our families and restore wholeness in Jesus' great name. Amen and amen.
Christ in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Oh Lord, Lord. inspiring message today is from Randy Reinhardt. Take it away, Randy. I'd like to begin by giving honor to whom honor is due. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Bible app called YouVersion. Uh, if you're not, it's, it's a wonderful tool. Uh, I use it. Fred uses it. My wife, Linda, uses it. Uh, every morning, uh, they have a devotional that's uh, really outstanding. There's a Bible verse, uh, there's a speaker, and they've, they've had a wide range of speakers from Tony Evans to N.T. Wright to Joyce Myers to uh, names of uh, men and women whom I've never heard of before. And they give a brief devotional, a video, and then there's a, a written devotional. And then again, the verse uh, is given with a prayer it's, it's about five minutes and uh, maybe a little longer. It's excellent. And there are also study plans and all sorts of things available. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. Uh, it's free. And I've been using it now since uh, Easter when our son Eric and his wife Andrea invited us to join, us, join them during Lent for 40 days of going together through a devotional. It was Eric, Andrea, Lynn, and me that did that together. Anyway, well, in a recent one, uh, this woman, Shelley Heights, spoke on Broken Crowns. She, that's her ministry, Broken Crowns Still Color. And it just, that, that title, that, those words just grabbed my heart. And, um, and I want to share a little bit of her story later in my message. Uh, she shares it quite freely. But I want to give her credit for, uh, for that theme, that idea, that thought that broken crayons still color. Amen. Well, when we think about rejection, uh, honestly, I, are often, I, I think of it as the opposite side of the same coin. Uh, in our failure, we can feel rejection. When we are rejected, we may feel that we have failed. And our failure, we can feel rejection. When we are rejected, we may feel that we failed. 
Like failure, rejection can come in many different shapes and sizes. We usually first experience rejection at a very young age. We were picked last for the kickball team. Our art project was not chosen for the special display. Our talent was not considered good enough to sing the solo in the school concert. We were not picked for the role we hoped to have in the school play. We were not part of the in crowd at school. A boy or a girl for whom we had fondness rejected us. We may have even felt rejection from our parents, which uh, certainly could have been intentional, but it, at that young age, we may have realized, or not have realized, excuse me, that it was totally unintentional. We just interpreted it the wrong way. As life moves forward and the stakes become higher, the pain of rejection becomes greater. We may have received a rejection slip from our job or our work. Perhaps you wrote a book or an article that was rejected. You can feel rejection from your coworkers or your neighbors. We may feel rejected by family members, a sister or brother or sister-in-law or brother-in-law. You may feel rejection from your spouse. Sadly, we can even feel rejection from our brothers and sisters in Christ. Rejection is perhaps the most common of emotional wounds. And wounds can be small. They can be like just like a paper cut. Or they can be very deep. They can tear our emotional skin and penetrate our feelings. And like a natural wound, if not cleaned and properly treated, there is the possibility of infection later. A University of Michigan study using uh, an MRI found that rejection actually activates the same parts of our brain as physical pain does. Isn't that amazing? In fact, they, they did a little experiment, they had an experimental group, and um, they, gave, they gave one group Tylenol and another group a placebo. And then with both groups of people, they uh, interjected uh, something that created rejection among the members of that group. I don't recall exactly what they did or how they did that, but the results were that the ones who had uh, taken the Tylenol prior to hearing those words of rejection felt less emotional pain than the ones who had not done so, who had taken the placebo. Isn't that interesting? Well, let me just explore with you some of the wounds that can occur with rejection. First of all, there is often emotional pain. Uh, we can feel lonely, anxious, even jealous. Uh, we can feel confused in our thinking. Uh, this is often very true. We, in the midst of our rejection, our, our thinking just becomes muddled and confused. Uh, we can easily become angry. In fact, there's a great example from the scriptures right at the very beginning in Genesis. Uh, in Genesis chapter 4, we read, beginning with verse 4, But he, God, did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. We all know the outcome of that story. In his anger, Cain killed his brother, Abel. 
And lastly, rejection can lead to what we call destabilization. Um, we can tend to incorrectly interpret the hurt we feel, viewing rejection as an indication of our self self-worth, leading us to feel even worse. Yeah, let me let me see, read that one more time. What's more, we tend to incorrectly interpret the hurt we feel, viewing rejection as an indication of our self-worth, leading us to feel even worse. I, I'm sure that we can all identify with these, whether we've experienced all four of them at the same time uh, in feeling rejected or just one or more of them. Uh, obviously, we can all think of many occasions in our lives when we were rejected and the actions that we took or failed to took, take excuse me, as a result of that uh, rejection. I can remember I was a senior in high school. I think I was a senior. might have been the summer before my senior year. I, I don't, yeah, I probably was, actually, because it was the summertime. And um, uh, a girl had stood me up for a date. Uh, we'd had a date plan, and she called at the last minute and said she wouldn't go out with me. So I was really mad. I was angry. So I thought I could do one of two things. Uh, at that time in my life, I didn't have the Lord, and I did drink quite a bit. And uh, I thought I can go out and buy a six-pack of beer and just drown my sorrows. Or I can do some weightlifting. I was a weightlifter back then, and I can just pump some iron and take my frustration out on the weights. Well, by God's grace, I guess, <laughs> I decided to do the weights. And I still recall a friend came by my house, a man named Mike, a young man, and said, Hey, Randy, come on, let's go out and chug a few. And I said, Nah, Mike, I'm, I'm pumping the iron tonight. And I had, I had one of the best workouts I'd ever had. I, I think I lifted more weight than I'd ever lifted before. I just took out all my anger, all my frustration, everything that I felt uh, as a result of being rejected by this uh, young woman. I took it out on the weights, and, uh, you know, afterwards I probably felt better. I, I don't remember now, but, but these things are very real, aren't they? And uh, rejection is very real. I want us to look at a biblical account. We'll look at more than one, but I want us to start with this one. Uh, the story I recall that story found in Genesis beginning with chapter 37. And there we read, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed in the land of Canaan. And these are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bela and Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his other brothers because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age. He was also a son of Rachel. And he made him a robe of many colors for him. Now, I, I think we would all agree that Joseph was a pretty cocky young man at 17 years old. He, he was telling tales on his brothers. He was his father's favorite. His father had made him this beautiful robe of many colors. And you can imagine how his brothers, who really were uh, stepbrothers, felt about him. They were all very, very jealous of him. And so as the story, uh, beginning with verse 18, uh, Joseph was sent to find his brothers who were with their herds of sheep and had moved from pasture to pasture. And now he's found them. And it says they saw him in the distance. And before he'd reached them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, here comes that dreamer. You may recall he also had some dreams. Uh, in one of those, there were 12 sheaves of wheat, uh, there were sheaves of wheat representing the brothers. Uh, there were 12 of them all together, representing the brothers who bowed down to him, to Joseph. Now, uh, they didn't like that very much either, uh, for obvious reasons. So they said, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We can say that a vicious animal ate him, and then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Well, when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off his robe, the robe of many colors that he'd on, had on. And then they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water, and it was a cistern. It was designed to catch water during the rainy season and was used to uh, provide water for herds of sheep and so forth. And at this point, it was dry. So they threw him in there, and... Uh, very interesting what happens next. Uh, then they sat down to eat a meal. 
<laughs> He's down in the pit. Help, help, let me out of here. And they're sitting down to eat a meal. Uh, they looked up, and there was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying aromatic gum, balsam, and resin going down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And they agreed. And when Midianite traders passed by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit, sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites who took Joseph to Egypt. Now, who were the Midianites and the Ishmaelites? Well, they, they were actually descendants of Abraham. So they were literally third cousins. Isn't that amazing? They, they're selling Joseph to their third cousins. And Joseph is taken off to Egypt. Now, you can imagine the rejection that he must have felt. I mean, come on. These are his brothers. They're, he's no longer able to see his father, whom he loved so dearly and who loved him so much, uh, his younger brother, Benjamin. Uh, he is, he doesn't know where he's going. I mean, well, he knows he's going to Egypt, but he doesn't know where, who, what, when, how. He didn't know if he's going to survive. I mean, wow. Talk about rejection. And he could have become very, very bitter. He could have become very angry. He could have become very confused in his thinking. All these uh, characteristics that we considered a few minutes ago, and, I, and I'm sure some of that occurred in his life. But as the scripture continues to unfold, he was sold to Potiphar's household and actually served them very well. Uh, to his credit, uh, he was an excellent servant in their household. He was very valuable to Potiphar. And, of course, we know the story how his wife tried to seduce him, and he ends up in prison, and he ends up in Pharaoh's court, and he ends up uh, a leader in Egypt. And 23 years later, he reconnects with his brothers. 23 years three years later. Now, how would you feel had your brothers rejected you? All but one of them, the youngest, Benjamin. They wanted to kill you. They changed their mind and sold you to a group of slave traders. They wanted nothing to do with you. They wanted to just be rid of you. You to be gone from their lives. Now, you're about to meet them 23 years later. What would you say? What would you do? Well, Joseph had changed over those 30, 23 years. He'd become quite a man. And he learned to see things from God's perspective. He learned to see that the rejection he suffered, the abuse he'd suffered, all the events that occurred in his life were part of God's bigger plan. His brothers came to him, and there's a whole series of events that we don't have time to, to review, but at one point, they all bowed down to him, just like the dream had prophesied that they would. And they were very concerned for their lives when they learned who he was, as you might guess. They knew they had done wrong. And although all this time had passed, they feared that he may take, he may make restitution. He may make, he may take out retribution for them. I think I got those words right. <laughs> oh my, what happened? Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me, but God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Therefore, don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your little ones, 
and he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Wow. He had indeed overcome his rejection. Uh, my story certainly isn't as dramatic as Joseph's, but I do remember a time, uh, many times, of course, but one time in, when I was at the Naval Academy that I experienced rejection of a sort. It was my senior year, and I was scheduled to be what we call a company commander. Now, there are 36 companies, and you're in the same company for four years. Uh, you know, so the same group of guys you're with for four years, and in a company are all four classes, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. So there's about 120 guys, so I was going to be the commander of those 120 guys, just like that picture on the left, I'd be marching out front of the company, uh, leading it in the parades, uh, that type of thing. And it was a you know, fair amount of responsibility and an and honorable position. But it was the summer before my senior year that I came to faith. And I'll never forget, the company officer called me into his office and had a conversation with me. And basically he said, Randy, uh, you know, there's been this major change in your life. And we're really not sure that that you're best suited to be the company commander because of this change. Isn't that amazing? And so uh, what we'd like to do is to recommend you to be the battalion subcommander. And the picture on the right, you can see the battalion staff. There are six companies make up one battalion. There were six battalions at that time at the Naval Academy. So I would be uh, second in command of the battalion behind the battalion commander. It was sort of a lateral move, so to speak. And I said, fine. Well, little did I know that God would use that situation because I was uh, roomed with a man whom I never met before. He was from a different company. He was the battalion commander. His name was Bob. And during those three months we lived together, I was able to share my faith with Bob. He would uh, bear with me as I was listening cassette tapes of Christian speakers. And although he did not come to faith that year, our senior year at the academy, he was a brilliant man. He was both an engineer major and an English major and uh, went nuclear power after we graduated. Very, very smart. But a couple years after we graduated, uh, I was away in, uh, with the P-3. I was flying in Sicily. It was the summer of 1976, so literally three years after we graduated. Linda traveled with the church we were part of from Jacksonville, Florida to Biloxi, Mississippi to a conference that they were attending. And as she was registering there in the lobby, a man came up and spoke to her and he said, you don't remember me, do you? And she says, uh, no, I'm not sure if I do. She said, he said, my name is Bob Kahn. And he had come to faith in Jesus. Hallelujah. Where do we turn in our time of rejection? Well, last week when we spoke of failure, I suggested that we turn to Jesus. We read in Hebrews, since then we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Did Jesus suffer rejection? Oh my gosh. Yes. In fact, found in all three synoptic gospels are the words from the psalmist, Psalm 118, verses 23, 22 through 23. In Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus says, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The cornerstone was the most important stone in any building in that day and still today. That stone aligns the whole entire building, the walls that go perpendicular to that stone or align with it. 
it's resting upon the ground, being placed in a solid place, sets the foundation for that building. The cornerstone was essential. And the psalmist writes, this stone, the builders rejected. They said, that's not the stone we want to use. But God said, yes, it is. That will be the chief cornerstone. God, I, God, am going to do this. And this verse, as I mentioned, is not only found in the Synoptic Gospels, but Paul, I mean, excuse me, Peter quotes it on the day of Pentecost. If you remember his famous sermon there, he quotes these same words. And he writes about them later in his epistle. <clears throat> excuse me, we find this in Second Peter, or excuse me, in First Peter, First Peter, but chapter 2. And I want to go there, and I want to remind us, last week I was talking about Peter. Here's Peter, a man who failed. He failed Jesus. He failed to stay awake. Three times Jesus had to come to him and ask him to stay awake with him the night before he was crucified. He failed in denying his Lord three times. And here's the man who's, who's this great apostle used mightily by God in, in, in what we call the beginnings of the church. And he writes these words. So keep coming to him who is the living stone. Though he was rejected and discarded by men, but chosen by God and is priceless in God's sight. Come and be his living stones who are continually being assembled into a sanctuary for God. For now you serve as holy priests, offering up spiritual sacrifices that he readily accepts through Jesus Christ. For it says in scripture, look, I lay a cornerstone in Zion, a chosen and priceless stone, and whoever believes in him will certainly not be put to shame. That's from Isaiah 28, verse 16. Peter continues, As believers you know his great worth, indeed, his preciousness is imparted to you. But for those who do not believe, again, the quote from the psalmist, the stone that the builders rejected and discarded has now become the cornerstone. This is all the Passion Translation. Jesus is our cornerstone. He was rejected by men. He was rejected by his Jewish brethren. He was rejected by the Jewish leaders, the, ones, the very ones for whom he came. And yet, God made him the cornerstone. He knows what you and I feel when we feel rejection. He's walked down that pathway before. Well, let me share with you just some very practical steps in dealing with rejection. Knowing that Jesus has gone before us. First of all, you need to, I need to, we need to step back and evaluate the situation. Sometimes we think we're rejected and we really aren't. Uh, again, back at the Naval Academy, my plebe summer when I was playing football for the first time, um, at the end of the summer, they made the cuts and my name was on the cut list. And I was, I was, shocked because I'd been playing pretty well. I was uh, often picked by the coaches to, to step up to the plate, so to speak. It was football, not baseball. <laughs> but uh, I was like, I was really confused. But what I did is I went to them and I double checked. And, and lo and behold, there was another plea. His name was Peter Reinhardt. In fact, spelled his last name the same way that I do. And when they marked his name off the list, they just, whoever was doing the marking just took mine off too. It was funny because we both graduated. Peter graduated as well. And, all, and during our four years, there, were, there was more than one occasion when the two of us were mixed up. Our two names were mixed up, I should say. So stepping back and evaluating helped me to realize that I had really not experienced the rejection that I thought I had. Uh, another situation, I was at, uh, when I was teaching at Chapel Gate one year, a few years, a few of my years, there was a staff member, and uh, as I would be walking down the hall, I would 
try to make eye contact and smile and wave and say hi. She would never look at me. And always just looking straight ahead, kind of a smirk on her face. And uh, once again, I could have taken that very personally. But I later realized that that's the way she was around virtually everybody. So ensure that you really are experiencing rejection. Most likely it's true in many situations, but it's always important to make sure. Secondly, I need to be aware of the potential for confused thinking and my inner critic. Wow, again, be aware of that. And, and especially that inner critic, that, that, that voice inside your head that says, you're no good, you're a failure, you blew it, you've been rejected again, you're never going to measure up. All those words, we need to be aware of those voices which are not the voice of God. And I'll speak to that in just a minute. But I do want to say this, first of all, when you're hearing, when you're listening, you may have sinned. I may have sinned in some way, possibly promoting or exasperating the circumstances. If that's true, then I need to draw on the grace of Jesus and repent from my part. I may have, have made this situation a lot worse than it needed to be or could have been. And should that be true, I need to take responsibility for my part. And if that's sin, for my sin, and I need to ask God for forgiveness and maybe... I need to ask someone else for forgiveness, a brother or a sister. I need to cast my burden upon the Lord. And I need to remind myself of his promises. Deal with those inner voices, those critics. Declare the word of God. Not what the voices are saying, but what God says about you. What God says about me. Cast that burden of rejection upon him. He will carry it for you. And lastly, I need to examine my the circumstances and determine, is, is there a need for forgiveness on my part? Do I need to forgive the person who's rejected me? Or do I need to forgive a, a, a larger entity than a person? Maybe it's a business or something else. But do I need to offer forgiveness? That may not always be true, but if it is, it's very, I, I, won't, I won't say it's very important, it's vitally important. It's essential. Uh, Shelley Heights, who I mentioned earlier, um, and she shares her story quite freely. So I'm sure that she would grant me permission if I'd asked to share her story. Uh, I, I won't share it in the details that she does. But... She grew up in a Christian home. Her dad was actually a pastor. She was a PK. She went to all the retreats and conferences and Sunday school and Bible study, the whole nine yards, gave her heart to Christ when she was about seven years old, and um, married a Christian man. He was in ministry. But when she was eight years old, uh, her grandmother was killed. In fact, it was worse than that. She was murdered. In fact, it was worse than that. It was her second husband who murdered her. And this was a man who actually her dad had introduced to Shelley's grandmother uh, at church one Sunday. And Shelley buried that pain and never was able to forgive the man who had killed her grandmother. Uh, he was deemed mentally ill and uh, never went to prison. He went to a mental hospital for several years, was released from there at one point. And Shelley also um, was sexually abused in junior high school. And in her 20s, about 25 years old, she actually got caught in a web of addiction. Uh, as a woman, she was addicted to pornography for two years. And as she began to get free from that entanglement, one of the keys was the forgiveness of the man who had murdered her grandmother. Now she's 28 years old, so this is it's 20 years later. And it was a process. It, 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 was a, it was a long process over some time. 
that she walked through with help from others. Others helped her to walk through that process. But as she walked through that process, as she came to a place where she could forgive this man, his name was Don, Don from murdering her his grandmother, her grandmother, excuse me, a great weight was lifted from her shoulders. A tremendous burden was lifted from her. She found a newfound freedom. She was, became free from her addiction. Many things changed in her life. And for you and for me, when we've experienced that rejection, there may be times when forgiveness is the key to us getting free. I want to remind us that our acceptance is in the one who created us and loved us. You are not defined by the opinions of others. You are not defined by your past mistakes. You are not defined by your successes or failures. In Christ, you are enough. In Christ, you are valuable and loved. In Christ, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I'd like to conclude with one more story by Stephen Furtick. Uh, he's preaching this. It's, it's relatively short. I was going to share it, but I, <laughs> I can't match him. This, this young man, he's only 40 years old. Uh, he's got a ton of energy. Uh, he's the pastor of Elevation Church which uh, you may know is a huge church, and they are the uh, source of Elevation Worship, many of their songs we've used, and he's actually a songwriter. In fact, the song we love singing for communion, Come to the Altar, he wrote that. The Blessing, he was one of the four writers of that song. In fact, that song was first sung by the Elevation Worship team at their service. I believe it was March 1st this year. So uh, he's an amazing young man, and uh, he's going to share another story, one that I haven't shared yet, about rejection. So join with me in enjoying this. In the book of Matthew, when it starts out, it, it gives what's called the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It tells all of the different generations through which Jesus was born. It traces it all the way back to the top. It's like Jesus' version of Ancestry.com. And if we, could show, if we could show Leah Matthew chapter 1, I don't think she would have been as frustrated. You know why? Because in Matthew chapter 1, I'm getting ready to blow somebody's mind in the back of the room. Okay? In the back of the room. Get ready. It's going to freak you out. Matthew is telling us how Jesus came into the earth. And he said, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah. Wait a minute. Judah was Leah's son. Leah was the one Jacob never even wanted to marry. And if you keep reading Matthew, I'm not going to do it because it's got a lot of names that I don't know how to pronounce. But it says, so and so begot, so and so begot, so and so begot, so and so begot, so and so. And it goes for 14 generations, and then 14 more, and then 14 more. And it's just a long list, and normally I would skip over it. But it says, we need to think about this. It says that Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah. Now skip all the way to verse 16. After all of the so and so's and the begots and the so and so's and the begots, it says, and then there was Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Now here's why I said it was going to blow your mind. Because Jesus came from the line of Judah. Judah came from Leah, the one that Jacob never even wanted. The Savior of the world was born out of the rejection of a woman who was unloved by Jacob. Now I want to tell you, if you're feeling rejected today, feeling like a failure today, God has a plan to bring forth Jesus in your life. 
Out of your rejection, out of your frustration, out of your failures, out of your defects, out of your flaws. So, so, isn't that cool? Isn't that amazing? Stand up, I'm closing. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing that God will turn rejection into a blessing? The one that Jacob never even wanted gave him the child that would ultimately produce the one who would save the world. You're chosen, Leah. You're chosen, Leah. You're chosen, Leah. I'm looking for unloved Leah. So I want to tell you, you're chosen to give birth to Judah, a praise that comes from your pain that will produce the presence of Jesus in your life. Wow. Wow. Everybody say wow. Man, that's our Jesus. Taking rejection and making it into a blessing. Hallelujah. Sometimes God wants to take our misery. He wants to make our misery. He wants to take our misery and make it into our ministry. To take our misery and become, make that misery become a ministry. I can't even say it. I'm so choked up. Wow. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to end with a blessing. And this one is from Australia. <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Lord. I'm sorry. This was part of my script. Oh, God, thank you. Oh, I saw this and it grabbed me. Every time I watch these blessings, I weep, but. I, something something just clicked in my brain, and I did the research. Brothers and sisters, this is from Australia. And Australia, in 1788, was first made a British colony as a penal institute. They would send prisoners there from Great Britain. For almost a hundred years, excuse me, in almost a hundred years, they sent a hundred sixty thousand convicts to Australia, men and women. These people were rejected. They were saying, "We don't want you here in the British Isles. We're sending you halfway around the world to this continent that no one's practically even heard of, called Australia, and we're going to." leave you there for the rest of your sentence because we don't want anything to do with you. They rejected. They didn't reform these people. They rejected these people. This nation of Australia was born out of rejection. Do you know that today, one out of five, one out of five Australians can trace their descendants to convicts. Wow. Amazing. Brothers and sisters, you're going to be blessed by the people, the body of Christ in Australia, the church in Australia, joined to that same cornerstone that we're joined to. As they worship together, as we worship with them, God's blessing. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and keep you, I pray, until we meet again. Hallelujah. Amen. From the bush to the beaches, the migrant to the indigenous. Though girt by sea, we're not isolated. We're the great south land of the Holy Spirit. Through the fires and drought, no virus could ever hold us down. Because we were made for such a time as this. So the Lord bless you and keep you, Australia, in the name of Jesus. Hey.
face toward you and give you peace. And Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn you 